Chapter Five of The Lady in Blue by Augusta Groner, translated by Grace Isabel Colbron. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Walter Thorne makes a discovery. At three o'clock on the afternoon of June fourth, a cab containing two men drew up at the door of the Grey House in Salzburg, the house where Elise Lehman died. The sun shone warmly on the gravel paths, but one of the men shivered as if in a chill. The other threw a sympathizing glance at him as he pulled the bell at the gate. "'I'm afraid coming here will be bad for you, Edmund,' he said. "'You are so excited already.' Walroth shrugged his shoulders. "'It would be too cowardly not to come,' he answered somewhat brusquely. Mrs. Diesler came down the path from the house. "'What can I do for you, gentlemen?' she asked. Then, without waiting for an answer, she exclaimed, "'Oh, it's the Baron! Oh, my dear sir! Isn't it terrible?' she hastened to open the gate but i can't let you in upstairs the police commissioner has the keys we have the keys with us said thorne leading the way to the house at the door he handed mrs diesler the keys and they followed her up the broad stairway the little window in the door of her own room was hung with a dimity curtain which moved slightly as if held aside by a cautious hand as the men passed up the stairs the housekeeper opened the door of the corner room then retired and waited at the head of the stairs in case she should be needed a door opened below and tony came out she had been living in mrs diesler's room since the catastrophe she stood at the foot of the stairs and called gently to the old woman tony's face was partly hidden in the white cloth that was wrapped about her head she had been suffering from toothache since early that morning who's up there she whispered the baron there were two of them the other gentleman seems to be a close friend or a relative oh i see aren't you coming upstairs why should i they'll call me if they want me what are you so excited about i'm not excited but i'm glad the baron's come so that i can get my money and go away you could have gone any time i'd have sent the money to you tony murmured something that mrs diesler didn't quite catch then she returned to the kitchen the sun flooded the big cheerful room as the two men entered it walroth last his eyes wandered from point to point with a touch of fear in them as if he expected to see something gruesome his heart drew itself together in the grip of an almost overwhelming grief a deep groan forced its way from his lips he pressed his hands to his temples and sank down on the nearest chair thorne whose robust nature had little sympathy with weakness in another man tried to keep his voice gentle you knew what awaited you here he said quietly why did you come if you felt you could not endure it it's so hideous so incomprehensible groaned walroth here where she lived i feel more strongly than ever what has gone out of my life god why did she do it what could have driven her to such a step you may find the answer to that question in her desk a letter that was not posted or some message she must have had something to tell you there was a long pause walroth half rose then sank down again Finally he whispered in a tone that was half a sob, "'I—I I can't do it. Will you look?' Thorne gave a sigh of impatience. "'Very well,' he said a bit sharply. "'I'll look about here, but I advise you to go, and go at once. It's only torturing you to stay, and you're no earthly good. Take the cab and drive to her grave. There's some sense in that. You owe it to her and to your love for her. Then go back to the hotel. I'll meet you there. Better do that, old man.' his voice softened and he laid a gentle hand on his cousin's shoulder yes yes i will this house is too dreadful walroth raised his pain-drawn face into which a new look of horror came as his eyes fell on the dagger on the mantelpiece thorne saw the direction of his look and stepped quickly between his cousin and the object of his horror go now dear boy you must have loved her very deeply and you've overestimated your own self-control he passed his hand soothingly over the other's hair walroth tried to pull himself together he may have felt that he was behaving like an abject weakling yes i'll go he murmured hoarsely don't laugh at me walter all my longing all my dreams of happiness centered in her you know how little women have meant to me until this woman came into my life i've lost everything that's what upsets me so don't laugh at me it was like a moan of pain thorne was alarmed he felt a doubt as to the wisdom of leaving the excited man to himself still it might be the best thing to do think of your mother edmund he said gravely when a man has a mother like yours he shouldn't say he has lost everything 
he laid his arm over the other's shoulders and led him downstairs and out to the waiting cab. Courage, he whispered, as Edmund pressed his hand in farewell. When Thorne entered the house again, a simply clad woman with careworn face met him in the hall. You wish to speak to me? he asked, as she stopped before him. What can I do for you? It's my wages, sir. Would you tell the baron when he comes back? He's not coming back. Oh, but I can give you your money. You were in the dead lady's service? I was her personal maid. How much is owing you? Thirty crowns. Is that all? Yes. But you should have something for the days you have been unemployed, through no fault of your own. I'm not asking anything for that. That's your affair, my good girl, but I am sure my cousin would want you to have full justice. I am representing him here. Will another thirty crowns compensate you for the loss of time? That is very generous, for I have another position waiting for me. I am glad to hear that. Will you stay in Salzburg? No, I'm going to be traveling with my new lady. She blushed deeply. I wonder why, thought Thorne. Then he realized that he had been staring at her with a deeper interest than the situation warranted for he had just discovered that the girl was exceedingly pretty. It was more than mere prettiness, although her beauty had nothing showy or conspicuous in it. It lay in the pure oval of her face, in the well-cut features, and above all in the expression of her lovely golden-brown eyes. But there were deep rings beneath those eyes, and a look of suffering in their clear depths. Her face was young, but its pallor made it look almost faded back of the evident suffering mental and physical which thorne with an artist's keen eye read in that face he saw marks of an unusual strength of character neither in body or mind could this young woman be classed with the average of human beings she interested him and he lingered in the hall you're going travelling are you sure you are strong enough i know from some experiences of my own that ladies are even more exacting when away from home and besides constant travelling is fatiguing he was talking against time, yielding to his wish to study her face. But it was evidently not her wish that he should. "'Oh, yes, I'm strong enough,' she answered rather shortly, drawing back with a touch of stiff reserve that made him regret his rashly revealed interest. He said no more just then, took out the money, and handed it to her. She thanked him politely, then turned toward the door of the housekeeper's room. "'One moment, please,' he called after her. "'Could you come upstairs after a while? I may want to ask you some questions about Miss Lehman before I report to my cousin.' "'If you ring for me, sir, I will come up at once. The bell button is to the right of the fireplace.' Then she disappeared into the door. "'Have to handle her carefully, I see,' thought Thorne, as he mounted the stairs. "'I suppose she has had unpleasant experiences with the male animal, and doesn't trust any of us.' Don't worry about me, Miss Touch-Me-Not. It's mighty easy to keep me away, and my intentions were strictly honorable. You looked so ill, I felt sorry for you. That's all. He laughed lightly, for he had said the last words aloud. Then he set about his duty of examining Elise Lehman's desk in the hope of finding some word of explanation, some message for her lover that might throw light on her desperate deed. He had to pass the fireplace on his way to the desk. He stopped there, took up the dagger, and looked at it thoughtfully. Then he went on and sat down at the desk. It was a big, old-fashioned secretary, a handsome antique with many drawers and pigeonholes. There was a miscellaneous assortment of objects on its top and writing shelves, a feminine confusion of things thrown or placed there by someone who had not even utilized the few useful articles in the mass. A pretty little daily calendar still bore the date of May 5th on its uppermost leaf and beside it stood a bunch of dried violets in an absurd basket shaped like a boat. The painter felt sorry for the poor flowers, for their term of existence was evidently shortened by their sojourn in that unsuitable resting place rather than in any of the many vases on desk or table. There was more such evidence on the desk to show Thorne that Elise Lehman had neither taste nor refinement. Then he opened the drawer in which hung a little bunch of keys. It was the drawer in which Commissioner Senfeld had placed the dead woman's jewelry and money. There were some sheets of paper there, closely covered with writing. Thorne took them out and began to study them. The lines on them had been written by a woman, but a woman who was not at ease with a pen. Thorne smiled involuntarily as he read the words. They were not the expression of original thought, but a mass of quotations, culled from many sources, and all pertaining to love. He wondered whether Elise Lehman had compiled this list to assist her in writing her love letters, or to give herself the appearance of a cultivation she evidently did not possess. 
for her awkward handwriting and the many mistakes she had made even in copying her quotations proved that her education was of the most elementary sort thorne was amused and annoyed too for he thought of his over-refined and ultra-sensitive cousin and rebelled against edmund's infatuation for such a woman he had not imagined that mere physical beauty could so hold a man of that type must have been because he knew so little about women anyway he murmured as he opened the other drawers one after the other there was little to reward his search a few memoranda of money spent and a short letter to a dressmaker written and then forgotten showed the same childish unfinished handwriting as the letter bore a signature thorne knew that elise had written the other notes as well she had left no word of any kind for her lover but she had kept all his letters carefully tied together in a separate drawer during his search thorne found an envelope containing several small photographs when he saw that it contained no writing he laid it aside until later as his first desire was to find some message for walroth now when he was sure there was no such message he took up the envelope and shook out its contents when he held the first picture to the light he started and then puckered his lips for a low long-drawn whistle a habit of his at any sudden surprise this surprise must have been a bit startling for the blood shot up into thorne's face and he rose hastily and paced the room for a few moments so absorbed in his thoughts that he scarcely noticed when he ran afoul of the furniture as he passed it it took him some little time to come to himself again when he did he looked about the room with a renewed interest taking in its details more carefully he went into the bedroom and looked about carefully there as well then he returned to the sitting-room somewhat calmer and rang for the maid he sat down in the bay window to await her coming he did not have to wait long come this way please he said as she halted by the door why did you hurry so you're quite out of breath i didn't want to keep you waiting sir she answered with some little difficulty as she sat down on the chair he designated the chair had been placed so that any one occupying it would have been full in the sunlight streaming through the window but as the girl sat down she gave it a slight apparently involuntary push when she was seated her face was in shadow thorne did not notice this but he did notice how very becoming was the soft red light that fell on her face through the silken curtain she looked up at him in calm expectancy what do you wish sir some information you may be able to give me yes were you in your lady's confidence no how long were you in her service not quite one month who had the place before you took it do you know this former maid could you tell me her name and where she is no the lady was without a maid when she engaged me she took me on while she was passing through lintz i see and you have no ideas as to where or how your lady lived before she became engaged to baron walroth no she didn't tell me anything about herself i hardly expected it i'd have to be longer in a lady's service before she knew whether she could trust me or not a lady humph did miss layman impress you as being a lady she dressed well was she refined the maid shrugged her shoulders but did not answer there was a short pause thorne rose and the girl followed his example then he asked another question with a certain urgent insistence please try to remember when miss layman ever said anything to you that would lead you to think she had been in berlin not very long ago or had appeared there in public the girl pondered for some few minutes then answered in the negative she had come forward into the full light and thorne saw with a start of pity how dull her eyes were how pale her cheeks the girl must be really ill he felt deeply sorry for her but he still had need of her did your lady write many letters he asked not many still she did write a few letters since i have been with her do you know to whom she wrote no miss layman always posted her own letters and she received letters yes many letters came from baron walroth but she received other letters too she went to the general delivery for them did she destroy those letters i do not know sir had she many visitors or friends hereabouts you can imagine that baron walroth is anxious to know what could have driven the lady to this desperate step all my questions are for the purpose of trying to help him trying to throw some light on the subject there was a short pause a dash of color came into the girl's cheeks and she timidly asked whether the lady had not written her fiance some word of farewell she may have thought it presuming to ask such a question for her tone was hesitating and uncertain she seemed surprised when she heard that there had been no message the lady had no visitors here in the house a dressmaker who came several times was the only stranger who ever came here 
i couldn't tell whether miss layman ever met anyone outside the house she went out every day generally during the forenoon and usually alone what was her mood cheerful no she was frequently depressed and melancholy i've seen her crying several times particularly the last days the very day she killed herself i urged her to go to the theatre i thought it might cheer her up she did and took me with her we went to the theatre frequently how did she seem that evening quiet and apathetic what play did you see a farce called charlie's aunt but that's very funny yes sir i laughed a lot but my lady didn't seem to care about it and she didn't say a word to me as we drove home then the girl gave an account of the happenings of that night and the following morning she spoke hastily a bit feverish thorne listened attentively is there anything more i can do for you sir she asked when she had finished her story no my dear child then i can go yes i mean i can leave salzburg my new lady is waiting for me in munich certainly you may leave whenever you like then i will go to-night bon voyage and good luck to you thank you sir the girl bowed and went out as she passed the fireplace thorne saw her give a light shudder he did not wonder at it the dagger on the mantelpiece must have called up unpleasant memories he left the room himself shortly locking it behind him he went first to the police station to give up the keys the inspector in charge told him that miss layman's stepbrother her only relative and heir had been notified as soon as baron walroth had given the police his address and had wired that he would arrive in salzburg in a day or two thorne gave walroth the packet of his own letters when he met him at the hotel but he did not show him the envelope with the photographs he kept that in his own inner pocket mrs diesler sat watching tony as the latter was packing her few belongings you are a bit vain though said the old woman apropos of nothing why do you think so asked the girl with a laugh when you went upstairs to that nice-looking gentleman you took off your bandage tony did not answer but bent over her bags with renewed energy End of chapter five